Stand and join us in worship. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. And everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. And the hope of nations. Savior, he can move the mountains. Oh, my God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. The author of salvation, the heroes and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. And now I surrender. Savior, he can move the mountains. Oh, my God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. The author of salvation, for he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King Oh Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King Sing He is mighty to save forever, the author of salvation, for he rose in You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome to church. It's good to see you all this morning. Got a good turnout. Uh, glad to see you here in person. And those of you who are joining us on uh, Facebook Live, we're glad that you're all with us today. I want to welcome you and send a special welcome to any visitors we might have. Uh, and just introduce ourselves. I'm Andrew, our associate pastor. This is David, our senior pastor. Mark, our youth pastor. And I believe Meredith's in the back. Uh, but we're just glad that you're with us today. And I want to invite you, if you are a visitor, uh, we would love to answer any questions you might have about our church. And the best way to do that is to connect with us by using one of our response cards. There's some on the back table. Uh, when you come in the, come in the door or on your way out, I guess, 
on the right there. Uh, and then if you're joining us online or you'd rather do this at winfieldbaptistchurch.com, there's a link at the top for response card. We would love to connect with you and follow up with you, answer any questions you might have about our church. Uh, but we're just glad that you're with us today. Please read your worship guide. There's a lot of announcements and things in there. I'm going to highlight a couple things. Uh, first off, uh, we have a quarterly business meeting directly following this service, and we're looking forward to that. Uh, it's kind of a celebration of what God's done uh, throughout the third quarter of the year, as well as an exciting opportunity. Uh, as many of you know, we've been working towards a renovation project that's part of our vision. It's kind of the next step in our vision plan for the physical plant of the church, and we're excited for that. And you've already given the money. It's already there. We've already done a lot of groundwork with our building committee, and now it's time to move forward. So we're excited. We invite you to come. It's a re good time to remind ourselves of the vision and then also to uh, get to ask questions and, uh, Lord willing, vote to move forward on that. So that's right after this service up in the chapel. Uh, this coming week, we've got a couple things going on. This one's not in your worship guide. But on Tuesday, we're having some carpets cleaned, and we need your help Monday night to move some furniture. Uh, so we are going to be moving furniture in the classrooms upstairs. And so if you could get here around, if you're able, and you can get here around 6 o'clock tomorrow night, I'll meet you right here at the Family Life Center doors, and we will move some things. I think I've got a couple dollies coming, so I don't think we need any more of those. But if you've got one, you want to throw it in the car or truck just in case, it uh, wouldn't hurt. Uh, but we could use your help with that uh, this Monday. Life groups are going to be kicking off this Wednesday, as well as youth groups. So if you're in the youth group, you'll be in the youth room at 6.30 on a Wednesday night. Uh, life groups, we have two options. You can either join a group that's going to meet in person, or you can be a part of the Zoom, meet, Zoom group that's going to be meeting online. If you have any questions about either one, want to get signed up, let me know. If you have already signed up, but you have not heard from your group leader yet, uh, don't worry about that. They're going to be making their contacts uh, probably over the next couple of days. Uh, but we're really looking forward to that as we get kicked off on Wednesday nights uh, starting at 6.30. Uh, I will still do the live Bible study on Facebook at 6.30. And if you want to be in the room for that, I'll be in the chapel. So uh, we'll be doing that uh, this week. As Eric comes forward, Eric's got a, an announcement to make, uh, but in just a few minutes, we're going to be praying and asking the Lord's blessing on our service and on our, on our giving and our offering. Uh, and if you have other th have um, would like to give, you can drop your offerings off on the way out the door, or you can give online using the, uh, the methods that are given on the uh, worship guide or on the screen. Um, and you can give online or through the app or text to give. Eric? Read your bulletin. Down at the bottom of the right page, Pastor Appreciation Month. God has provided us with three wonderful pastor pastors. Please be diligent in showing them your love, gratitude, and support in your own unique ways. Financial contributions may be given to Nancy, Eric, or one of the deacons. You may also designate your gift and place it in the offering plate or mail it. Presentation of your combined gifts will be made on November the 1st. So we've had a, a year. We'll just call it that. We've had a year. And our pastors have been right there for us all through this year, coming up with all sorts of solutions for all sorts of problems that we never thought we'd have to face. So Let's take this time in October, Pastor Appreciation Month, to show them how much we appreciate what they've done for us and what they do for us every day. And give generously, and as it says here, you can give it to Nancy, who she's hiding back there in the back. Hi, Nancy. Give it to me, give it to one of your deacons, or you can just designate it and put it in the offering plate. Thank you. All right, thank you, Eric. Before we go to prayer, we want to lift up a few different prayer needs uh, and update you on a few things that have some of our regular needs. Uh, we want to keep praying for Debbie Loudermilk. A week from tomorrow, Lord willing, she'll start her radiation treatment, uh, so be lifting her up. Also keep praying for Connie Jeremiah. So I'm going to share a little more about her in just a minute, but uh, lift her up in your, in, uh, in, in your prayers regarding her cancer treatments. And we have a table in the back on your way out today. 
Uh, if you get a chance, check it out. Uh, there's there's some different things you can you can write on a flag. You can uh, give uh, financially, and all the proceeds will go to help out Connie and Jim. Um, but we just want you to be a part of uh, what they what the ladies are doing and, and leading us in for uh, pass for pastor appreciation. Stop it. Uh, don't do that for breast cancer awareness month. Uh, and we want to make sure that you are able to uh, be informed, but also support those that you know that are that are um, that are going through uh, through this or have dealt with it in the past. Um, and, and we know that almost everybody uh, is affected in our church body. So so get a chance to to check out that table. Um, but but we're going to keep praying for Connie and her treatments. Keep praying for Kenny. Uh, Kenny might have a possible diagnosis uh, for what's going on, so pray for him as he goes back up to Cleveland soon. He's got some follow-up virtual appointments, but pray for Kenny that they would that they would find out exactly what it is. Uh, but it's always good to have uh, to to know, and so hopefully this is a uh, one less question mark along the way. So uh, let's pray for Kenny. Keep praying for Jim Reinick. He was able to move into a rehab facility. This uh, this last week, uh, keep praying for him and for and for Pat. Keep praying for Nolan Anderson. Uh, Nolan w- went to the hospital on Monday and was put on a ventilator. And each of the last several days, they've been able to turn down the oxygen, and he's responded really, really well to that. The next step is uh, that he would uh, be able to wake up after they take him off sedation, so that they can uh, take him take him off the vent. So we're looking forward to that. But keep praying for Nolan. Pray for his wife Sissy, as she's got some health needs as well, and also uh, Beth and uh, and Jill, their daughters, as they take care of them, uh, as well as the rest of their family. Also lift up John Hoover. Uh, John is Teresa Simon's uh, neighbor, and we put this out last night. He broke his he broke his hip. Uh, a couple months ago, and after surgery, he's still in a lot of pain, and they found that there's complications from that surgery that are putting him in that pain, so he may have to have another surgery. How about your unspoken needs as well as unsaved friends and family members? We know the Lord goes before us on these things, and we've been praying each... Yes, Beth? Okay, pray for Joe Palestrini as he's having his cancer surgery this Friday, all right? Okay, so it's an extensive surgery, uh, so, so keep lifting him up, and uh, we'll get an update for you after that surgery, but, but lift up Joe and Beth in your prayers. We've been trying to pray for a church or a missionary each week by name, and this week we do want to pray for Jim and Connie Jeremiah and their ministries. As she's going through her treatments here, pray for them. They're away from the ministry that they love, the ministries they've been called to, uh, which are Rock of Ages Ministry, Zambia, as well as the New Hope Children's Village that... Uh, that Connie runs when they're over there. So pray for those ministries as we pray for them to get back up on the field. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to humbly offer our worship to you today. In light of the grace that you have shown us through Jesus, we want to honor you with our praise. Please bless our offerings as we seek to praise you through the preaching and hearing and application of your word, our prayers, our songs, our acts of service, and our financial gifts. Lord, we pray that you would bless them and that they would bring you glory. Father, we lift up these by name that, we've, that we have named and those who are unspoken, Lord, we lift them up as well. But we ask for healing and strength for all, for Debbie, for Connie, for Kenny, for Jim, for Nolan, for John, and for Joe. Father, we pray that you would lift them up and meet each of their needs. Lord, we pray that you would sustain and bless our, mini- our missionaries and place, pray specifically for Jim and Connie. Father, we lift up Rock of Ages, Zambia, and the New Hope Children's Village and ask that you would continue to bless their ministry and watch over it as they are away from it. Father, we pray that you would sustain uh, Jim and Connie during Connie's treatments. And, and Father, as they are, they're fighting, they're fighting a battle on the personal front, but they're also uh, longing to be with, we, be with those they minister to regularly. We pray that you'd be with all of our missionaries and we pray that you would carry them along and bring fruit that the gospel would go forth. We pray for our personal testimony as we've lifted up unsaved friends and family members and we ask that our gospel testimony, that we would have conversations with them that could share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Father, in a broken and damaged world, we pray for peace. We pray for help in our nation and around the world. We pray for wisdom and guidance for our leaders. 
And Lord, we pray for the gospel preaching churches around the world, sending out believers to do your great commission to make and teach disciples. We ask for your blessing on them. Father, you've given us this mission in the world, and it's not one that we deserve or one that we can fulfill on our own. But when you showed us your mercy, you showed us your grace through Jesus Christ. You called us to live a new life. You called us to be different. Your spirit has regenerated us, given us new birth. And now that's enabled us to live as lights in a dark world. I pray that you would turn up the light at Winfield Baptist. Make us different from the world around us. Where people are ready to fight, lie, and complain. We ask that you would please make us ready to live for peace, kindness, and gentleness so that others may come to know you through the gospel of Jesus. Lord, this is only going to happen if our church has its roots in the message of Jesus and the hope that comes from him. And Father, I pray that you would root us even more deeply in your gospel and in your word. Keep transforming us as your people and as a church. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
You may be seated. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Hebrews 10, 20 through 24. All right, thank you, Dana. There's our goal this morning, motivate each other to acts of love and good works. Uh, I hope that's the challenge you'll accept as you hear the message today. Uh, because that's what the world needs to see, the works of the believers. 
All right, welcome back. Most of you I recognize, some of you I don't. Uh, the masks may, uh, may hide your face a little bit. But we're continuing our new series. Uh, it's a series called A Look Behind the Curtain, and it's a study of church leadership. Uh, basically, it's stayed in uh, the letters of Timothy and Titus, the young men that Paul was mentoring in the ministry at the time. And um, we've, we've enjoyed, I, I have enjoyed, discussing you know, the differences between an elder and a deacon. That's important. Right? We've discussed that. One is a, a, is a leader of, of, of service, and, and one is a spiritual authority. And now where we've got to, if you paid attention the last couple weeks, we've gotten to the missions of those who have been given spiritual authority in the church. We've been talking about that last week. The, the very last sentence said, hey, Titus, I'm, I'm encouraging you. Go, go make sure you're teaching these things. Encourage the people. Correct the people when they're not on the right path. You're going to hear the same thing again today. So what's happening now is you're getting evaluation material on how you can look at that person in the pulpit and see, is that the person I need to follow or not? Or are they living up to the expectations given in the text? So, again, that's one of the points of the series. Now, I have been using the, the Wizard of Oz. I've enjoyed that as I shared with you. We've had kids in the congregation, and so that's one reason I've used it. Uh, another are the examples that are there. You remember last week, probably the most familiar picture that comes to mind when you think of the Wizard of Oz is Dorothy and the Tin Man and the Scarecrow and the Lion arm in arm going down the yellow brick road, right? There, again, you got this song in your head. Thank you, right? Thanks, Pastor. Um, and, and we discussed that. That's a great illustration of who we should be. Dorothy didn't just put her nose down and say, I'm, I know the path, I know the end state. I'm just going there, and as soon as I can get there, I'll be done. No, she took people with her. And that should be our goal, is to bring people with us. Now, I'm going to break down some of the, the special needs of the people she had compassion for. Let's talk about the scarecrow. What did the scarecrow need? Come on. It's Wizard of Oz 101. What did the scarecrow need? If I only had a brain, right? If I only had a brain. Um, I could have used that last week. Because we talked that, that as Christians, we're supposed to live wisely. When we're living fully in the day... We are to live wisely. We're to live as if we have a brain. We're to stop and think before we speak. We're to stop and think before we act. We're to stop and think before we make decisions. How many of you come to the end of the day and say, Man, I wish I had a brain. All right? Happens to me all the time. That, that would have worked last week. Okay. How about the lion? What did the lion need? Courage, courage right? He needs courage. And he sang the song, If I only had the noise. Right? If I only had the noise, I think it's a try at uh, a good, tough New Yorker accent, but it failed. Uh, but he, he said, if I only had the nerve. Again, that would have applied last week, because we said to live fully today, we're supposed to live righteously, which means we do the right thing even when it's unpopular. That takes courage. Okay? How many times have you made the wrong decision simply because you didn't want to offend or you didn't want to hurt, and you know, man, if I only had the nerve to do the right thing, right? A good application last week. I saw an application for this week in this guy, all right? This next guy, the tin man. What did he need? Heart, right? If only had a heart. Part of the lines of his song got me and, and, and drew me into the text today. He said, if I only had a heart, I'd be tender, I'd be gentle and awful sentimental. Um, this, this will draw on something that we talked about last week and we're going to talk about today. Because that third point last week was be devoted. And devotion is a matter of the heart. Devotion is a matter of desire. Devotion is a matter of passion. And you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, if you are saved, you should have that new heart that has the desire to do the good things God has called us to do. And so let me give you the big idea, the bottom line up front. Here we go. If you get nothing else, get this. Our passion, speaking as Christians should be to live such a good life that those around us will want a new heart too. Okay? The point of salvation, we were given a new heart. We're going to talk about that today. And so we should live in such a way, such a good life, that it should make those around us want a good heart too. Okay? That's our goal. So let's go to the text. Let's see what supports this big idea. And let's see what we can apply. Won't you stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word? I'm in... Paul's letter to Titus, the third chapter, picking up where we left off last week. We are in verse 1 of chapter 3 of the letter to Titus. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, I read from the New Living Translation. That's why it sounds 
a little more modern. Okay, this is God's word to us. Remind the believers to submit to the government and its officers. They should be obedient, always ready to do what is good. They must not slander anyone and must avoid quarreling. Instead, they should be gentle and show true humility to everyone. Once we, too, were foolish and disobedient, we were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy, and we hated each other. But, here's the big eraser, when God, our Savior, revealed His kindness and love, He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of His grace, He declared us righteous and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Titus, this is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to insist on these teachings. Why? So that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. These teachings are good and beneficial for everyone. Let's pray. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to open your word and grow from it again. Uh, thank you for all who made it out this morning, all who are online this morning. Uh, we, we have a great opportunity today to be more like our Savior, Jesus Christ, and that's what we're expecting. Uh, the word is challenging. The word cuts, as we know. And, uh, and today, I pray that it does its work. We, we want to be the people that the world looks at and sees as an example of, of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Those who aren't Christians, thank you for bringing them to church. Thank you for putting them online. Uh, whatever it is, uh, keep them engaged. And when it comes time, Father, I just pray that the conviction of uh, the Holy Spirit will be so strong on their heart that today will be the day of their salvation. Uh, so now remove me from your word and speak through it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please be seated. All right. Now, I need you to realize something that is bigger than you'll probably appreciate. You know how we do our series here. If you're new to us, this is, this is the new information. Um, we get together through the course of the year. We meet every week. But we get together and we, we plan next year's sermons. We have it planned out usually by the end of October. So by the end of this month, we will have the sermon series planned all the way through the end of 2021. That takes a lot of prayer. It takes a lot of preparation. It takes a lot of conversation. You know, we talk about, hey, what are the trends? What's going on in the church? What's going on in the community? What do we need to address from the pulpit in the next year? So we do that. We plan it out, okay? And that's, that's me, man. I've got to have a check in every box. I'm that guy. I'm OCD. I've got to have everything planned out. You know what COVID did? <laughs> COVID took that plan and went, yes! I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And boy, it messed things up. We, we lost an entire series for COVID. I mean, we're going to have to squeeze it in some other place. We move things around and, and push things around. And so I'm telling you this because we didn't plan this sermon for today. And yet, I can't think of a better day for it. Just sitting there tracking my Facebook feed, getting fresh energy before the service. I see God's timing was the best. Because we really need to talk about this. Don't jump into your Facebook now and delete your posts. Don't go on liking things yet. Listen to the sermon first, then go home and clean up your mess. Because there are a lot of messes out there. All right, for those who are trained, anybody trained in the seven habits of highly effective people? Got a couple of you? You know the hand signals of each of the habits? You better know them if you're trained. What's this one? Anybody? Come on, you seven habits gurus. Begin with the end in mind. All right, begin with the end in mind. It's very important, okay? It's very important. So let's go to the end and begin with the end in mind. Verse 8, Titus tells us the end state or, or the ultimate goal, the direction that we're going with this sermon. He says the goal of this teaching is so that all who trust in God, every Christian in the room, will devote themselves to doing good. 
That's beginning with the end in mind. I, I, my goal is that you will devote yourselves to doing good. And we'll specifically see what that means today in the earlier verses. Now, I'm going to lay it out. As I mentioned to you, devotion is a matter of the heart. And so I'm going to lay this out pretty simple. We're going to follow it systematically. Because Paul gives Titus the, the results of a, a new heart. He gives him the results of an old heart. And he explains the transformation from one to the other. So that's our layout this morning. Let's begin with a new heart. The longer, sub, the longer heading here would be how to live in a pagan society with a new heart. Really. So it just says new heart. But it really is how to live in a pagan society with a new heart. Before I start with chastisement, let me remind you. Context is critical. They were not living in a democracy. This instruction that I read to you was given to people who were living under an empire, the Roman Empire. Did they have a chance to vote their people in or vote their people out? Absolutely not. People bought their way into authority or they married their way into authority. Most of them were ill-equipped for the jobs. Most of them were ill-mannered. Most of them were socially high, super high status, low compassionate, ungodly pagans. The leadership that they were told to submit to was horrific. They were tyrants. And yet, what did he say? Christians, submit to government officials. Submit to government officials. And guess what? That wasn't just for the first century. That's for the 21st century as well. Hope a little context goes a long way. Let me share a somewhat lengthy explanation of, of John MacArthur's on this issue. Um, he believes, and I agree, that as a nation we have digressed to something close to what was going on in the first century. He says this, Through its leaders, its legislative bodies, and its courts, the United States has adopted not simply a non-Christian, but a distinctively anti-Christian stance and agenda. Anything and everything that is explicitly Christian and biblical has been swept away under such guises as separation of church and state, equal rights, and religious and moral tolerance. He's right. We can all say amen to that. All right, we can all say amen to that. But he didn't leave it there, okay? He didn't leave it there. Let's be careful. He goes on to say this. Attempting to fight fire with fire, Christian organizations have sought to counter anti-Christian ideas and programs by using non-Christian tactics. They have decided it is time to stand up for their rights and have declared war on the prevailing non-Christian culture especially the liberal national media, listen to this, they, Christians, have become hostile to unbelievers, the very ones God has called them to love and reach with the gospel. That's an ouch, not an amen. That's an ouch. Listen, this is God's timing, if ever it was. Christians are not protesters. Okay? Christians are not anti-government. Christians are not social media warriors. All believers, Christians, are to submit to government authorities as if we're submitting to the Lord himself. Why? Well, if you were in the men's class there in the last hour, you studied Romans chapter 13, what's it say? All authority comes from God, from the president of the United States down to the local magistrate in Winfield. All authority is given by God. So to rebel against any authority is to rebel against who? God himself. That's why we have to submit to governing officers. We also have to be obedient. As Christians, we must obey the laws of our nation and our state and our local government. That obedience does come with a caveat that has precedence. Acts chapter 4, if you know the story... Peter and John are ordered not to preach and teach about Jesus. And what did they do? They said, all right, that's where the line is. I submit to government officers. I'm going to be obedient until you tell me to go against God's command. They said, all right, at this point, we've got to submit to God, not to you, and accept the judgment that you give. All right, that's how it works. That's the caveat. How does that work today in 2021? Let me give you a real example. Let's talk about the legalization of same-sex marriage or marriage equality. Folks, we don't live in a theocracy. This is not a theocracy in our country. Crime isn't sin. 
Righteousness isn't legal. That's not how it works. All right? In our country, we have government benefits that come with marriage. So who are we to say an unsaved couple cannot have those benefits? So, hey, that's the law, right? Can we obey the law? Sure. Right? We don't do anything but heterosexual marriages in this church. That's it. And we never will. We will only marry a man and a woman. And it will only be through God's path of marriage. So we will never change that. So we can follow the laws of the land and still carry out the will of God. So we're good. We can submit. What happens, though, when they come to the door and say, no, now you're going to have to do same-sex marriages? Like Peter and like John, we'll say, no, we won't. At this point, we submit to the highest authority and we'll accept your consequences because God sits on the throne and we'll follow God's ways. Does that make sense? We submit to authority, government authority. We are obedient to a point, to the point where we are told to go against obedience to God. That's when we can, we won't rebel. We just simply submit to God's authority. Silently, without complaint, without making names, without causing a mess. We just submit to the highest authority, okay? All right, be obedient, do what is good. This is a general statement. Even though the world around us seems to be getting more and more hostile to those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, we must still continue to look for opportunities to do good. Why? How do you overcome evil? With more evil? No, you overcome evil with good. That's the only way to overcome it. So in our culture, in our society, we as believers have to continue to look for ways to overcome evil with good, not to respond with evil. Here's the next one. This is the challenge. Do not slander. Do not slander. The Greek word here is very recognizable. It's blasphemo. You recognize that word? Blaspheme. That's where we get blaspheme. What's it mean to blaspheme? It means to speak reproachfully of someone. It means to speak evil of someone. It means to defame someone. John MacArthur says, It is tragic that many Christians speak contemptuously of politicians and other public figures. If you profess to be a Christian and you're bad-mouthing or insulting a government official, I don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat, stop it. That's not a good heart. All right, it's not a good heart to do that. We do not slander. Spiritual authorities, as you hear, are commanded to encourage and correct if it doesn't stop. Next, do not quarrel. Do not quarrel. All right? This is obviously in the context of government officials, but it applies to life in a pagan culture. If you haven't learned it yet, it's extremely rare that you're going to win a political argument. How many of you have ever won a political argument? Really? Especially with an unsafe person. Stop and think about this, the subject specifically of abortion. Abortion is murder. It's an abomination to God. There is no question in my mind that my spiritual beliefs, my faith in Jesus Christ, roots that as sin. All right? I'm probably not going to convince an unsaved person of that because they don't have the same heart that I have. And what I'm going to do if I fight and argue with them over that point, I'm going to polarize the conversation. They're not going to credit me with anything. They're not going to believe anything I have to say because I have just polarized it. But what happens if instead of arguing about that, we talk about Jesus? What happens if instead of going after the politics, we go after the person and bring them Christ? Do not quarrel. There's nothing to be gained in a political argument. Be gentle instead. I'll continue that line of discussion. Instead of quarreling with them about t politics, what if I found a way to introduce the gospel? What if I shared how, and we'll talk about it in a minute, we can have a new heart? What if they get a new heart? Then maybe they'll see abortion as sin too, right? See how that works? I don't have to convince them that abortion is sin. I need to convince them that Jesus Christ is their Savior, and then Jesus will change their heart without quarreling. Make sense? I hope it does. We're gentle. We're also humble. This is the problem in our country today. It's pride. What is dividing this nation? Pride. I'm right, you're wrong. I'm right, you're wrong. <laughs> I know what's going on. This is a conspiracy. This is this. This is that. I know your motives. I've got it all figured out, and if you're not with me, you're wrong. Hmm. We think we've got it all figured out. That's what's causing the most commotion in our country. We all think we're right. And that's not cool. Think about this. 
I, I talked to somebody about this the other day. You got one person in, in a political position of power, okay? This one person is in a position of authority. And one person looks at that person and sees Pharaoh. Another person looks at that person and sees King David, but they're looking at the same person. What's the problem? Perspective. How you're seeing things. And most of us are wrong in that case. That's where humility comes in. It would go a long way if we would all just be willing to be wrong. Sometimes, if not all the time. Humility. Okay. There's other words that, that go in the Greek there. There's words like gentle, mild, meek. All these things. Humility is attractive. Okay, It's attractive. So, there's a simple but important phrase at the end of that section. It says, to everyone. Some translations say, to all men. Uh, others will say, to all people. What does all mean in the Bible? All. It means all races, all colors, all sex, all political affiliation, all religious affiliation. It means all. All means all. We are to be this way with all people. So that's a snapshot of what it looks like to be a Christian in a pagan world today. It means those things that I just read out to you that Paul told Titus. Now, he's going to contrast it with the old heart. Now he says, but you know what? We used to be this way. With the old heart, we, we had different things. And you notice I put were in all caps because we're not supposed to be like that anymore. We were, what did he say? We were foolish and disobedient. Before we got saved, when we had the old heart, we were foolish and disobedient. Foolishness is just simply the absence of wisdom. Before we got saved, we didn't have that connection with God. We couldn't, we couldn't do as James said and say, seek wisdom from God. No, we, we just had worldly wisdom and, and man's wisdom. And so when we made our decisions, they were based upon our own desires. You heard him talk about that. For our own pleasure, we made decisions and we made foolish decisions before we got saved. We were disobedient before we got saved. We, we, we had the conviction of the Holy Spirit because He convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, of God's judgment. So even as an unbeliever, we had that conviction, but we didn't care. God, pleasing God just didn't bother us. And so we did whatever we wanted to do. We were disobedient. Now we've got to stop and say, am I still disobedient? Am I still foolish? If you are, then you need to take a salvation check this morning. Where am I with God? Right? Where am I with God? Next, he said, we were misled and bound. We were misled and bound. Um, and this is, this is powerful because Satan is stronger than we give him credit for. Everyone is born a sinner. We're all born dirty. We're all born bound by Satan. We are born his servants. And we can't break that on our own. He is more powerful than we are, but he's not more powerful than Jesus Christ. Jesus breaks that bondage. He, he breaks that that power that Satan has to mislead us because that's what he wants to do. He's a conquered foe, as Kurt Shafley always calls him. Satan is a conquered foe, but guess what? He can still mislead people. And those that he has control over, he spins that agenda every way he can to keep them because he wants them to be miserable too, misled and bound. If you feel misled and bound, again, it's a time for a check. We were full of evil Envy and hatred. You can see the word malice in some of your translations as well. Uh, it's just as appropriate. The literal meaning of this is vicious character. A person with vicious character has connotations of malice, evil, trouble. When you bring it all together, this little phrase, it means wickedness that is not ashamed to break laws. Wow. We expect that of unsaved people, don't we? Do we see it today of unsaved people? Man, they're, they're just breaking laws left to right. There's lawlessness. There's attacks against our law enforcement. Where does that all come from? That comes from the wicked heart, the old heart. But as Christians, how should we respond? Should we get into 4A too? Should we get down and follow their tactics and their antics? Absolutely not. We're to rise above. We're to be different. Different in a good way. That's what we're called to be. We're not supposed to be full of evil and envy. And hatred. So what has Paul done here? Paul in the first three verses has compared an unsaved heart versus a saved heart and your actions in a pagan culture and how it looks. And now he explains how to make the transition from here to here. So this is important. For Christians, this is our reminder how we got here. This is our reminder how we got a clean heart and why we need to live like we have it. If you're not a Christian, this is a pretty cool explanation of what it means to be saved. 
You hear Christians talk about it all the time. I'm saved. I'm saved. What's saved mean? Well, here we go. Let's walk through it. God saved us. Okay? God saved us. And this is, to me, the most powerful statement because it said, because of His mercy, not because of anything we have done. So any Christian in this room did nothing to deserve your salvation. It didn't matter how good of a person you were or what good deeds you did. You were only saved by grace through faith and not of works, lest any of us should boast. That is humbling. That should remind us, God saved us. I did not save myself. He saved us by sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins and raised Him from the dead to know we'd have eternal life. He saved us. What's it mean to be saved, by the way? It means to be saved from sin and its consequences. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is what? Death. The gift of God is what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay? God saved us. He saved us from sin and its consequences. We're no longer bound. Okay? Next, God cleansed us. God cleansed us. And we talked about this last week. God doesn't just overlook our sins and say, ah, we'll let that pass. He cleanses us from them. And He separates us how far? As far as the east is from the west, they never touch. So once I reach out to God and pray from a contrite heart for His forgiveness, He cleanses me of those sins and He makes me new. This, this wording here in the Greek means a regeneration. That's why we call it a rebirth or born again. We are made new. We are cleansed because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. God cleanses us. God gave us the Holy Spirit. Uh, we could talk this all day. I'm a very visual person. When I, when I visualize the Trinity, I visualize God sitting on a throne. He's high above everything, above all creation. We can't actually see His face. We know that. But the light is so bright, you can't even look at it. That's God on His throne. And where is Jesus? Sitting in His right hand. We know that Jesus ascended after those days He spent with His disciples after His resurrection. He ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of God to make intercession for us. What's that mean? Okay, I got the throne here. I got Jesus there. I got Satan down here. Satan tossing up these salvos to, to God saying, Look what David did. Look what he did again. He's failed you again. And Jesus steps in every time and says, No. I cleaned that up. I took care of that. I died one time for all time. He accepted mine for his. He's covered. Isn't that awesome? Right? You've got Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father defending you from Satan who is trying to call you out. And Jesus said, no, I covered that. Where's the third person of the Trinity? Right here in this new heart. He came to live with you the minute that you were saved. You were indwelled by the Holy Spirit. The power of God, the power of creation came and resided within you. What's He do? One, He identifies you in the family of God. He is, he is that namesake for you. He identifies you. He seals you. And the wording is, is like melting lead to cover a scroll back in those days. He seals us and only God can open that seal. He gifts us. He gives us the ability to do the things that we can do well for Him, for His kingdom. He, uh, he allows us to understand the Scriptures when we read them. He opens them up to us so that they're living and breathing. And one thing He does that the Scriptures speak of, He gives us the ability or the will to do what pleases God. Right? The Holy Spirit in our heart gives us the will to do what pleases God. That's why this is so important. If you are saved, you can't say can't. You can only say won't. You can't say, I can't live this way. It's just impossible. If you're saved, you have to say, I won't live this way. I'm choosing not to. Right? That's powerful. Finally, we talked about this last week. God gave us hope. Right? God gave us hope and eternal life. The Holy Spirit seals us until the day of redemption of the purchase price, until Jesus Christ returns, either for us individually or for us corporately. And so armed with that, we discussed it last week, right? We've got learn, live, and look, if you remember that. We learn from the past. We don't live in it. Those of you who think the good old days were good, you may have a salvation issue. Because if your best days were in your sinful past, something is wrong. Because your best days are today while you're following Jesus Christ. So we learn from the past. We learn from the sins that we committed and the consequences we suffered. And we said, I'm not going to do that anymore. We learn from it. We live fully today. We've talked about that already. We live wisely, right? We live righteously. We live devoutly. We're living fully today, and we're looking forward to tomorrow, whether it's tomorrow, 10 days, 100 days, whatever it is down the road when Jesus comes back for us. Armed with that knowledge that we have eternity with Him, we can submit to authorities. 
We can obey authorities, right? We can keep our mouths shut and not slander and not quarrel. We can do those things in light of the future that's ahead of us because we know we win no matter what political changes happen. We know how it ends, right? We know how it ends. So that's kind of cool. I enjoy that. Again, back to verse 8. He says, all right, Titus, you got to teach all these things to the church. you got to make sure that they're getting this. And so here's your last thing that we'll do before we close. It is the responsibility of spiritual authorities not to suggest, but to insist that believers devote themselves to doing good. That's why you need to find a church, a church to make your home, a church where you can sit under the spiritual authorities of that church and know that you're going to be fed the truth, the word of God, that will continue to change you and mold you and make you the person God wants you to be. That's why it's so important. As usual, this message is written to and about Christians. So Christians, we've got to take the look in the mirror. We look at the old heart, look at the new heart. Where, where are you? All right? this, this is a mirror of God's word. Where are you, old heart or new heart? Are there things you need to repent of? Obviously, if you're not a Christian, you heard the truth. You heard that God will save, and only God can save. And if you're ready today, if you've had questions or confusion in the past, let's clear it up. Let's make sure you understand right here and right now, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ or not, do you have the old heart or do you have the new heart? Today you can have that transplant. Today you can be saved if you're ready to surrender to Jesus Christ. Father God in heaven, thank you for your word. It's truth. You've guided us in your truth. And now, Father, we pray that you will bless the invitation. Uh, Show us how it is you want us to respond because uh, your, your word does the work. So thank you for that. Uh, And I pray specifically for anyone who's here or online who's not a Christian. I pray that they understand this is just not about religion. This is about faith in Jesus Christ and a relationship with our Creator that changes our heart. And today that change can take place if they'll surrender. So God, give them the courage and the strength to step out and do that. We love you and we thank you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This is your time to respond. Hide your face from my sins And cover my iniquities Create in me a clean heart And renew a right spirit within me Don't cast me away from your presence Don't take your spirit from me Restore to me the joy of your salvation Restore to me the wonders of your love Restore to me joy of your salvation restore to me restore to me me away from your presence. Don't take your spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore to me all the wonders of your
salvation. Would you stand, please? Restore to me all the wonders of your love. Yeah, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore to me. Restore. David's prayer after his uh, infamous sin with Bathsheba, and God did restore him. So uh, whatever it is you're dealing with, whatever it is you need to, to ask forgiveness from, uh, he can do that, and he will. And we'll help you any way we can. Uh, meeting right after this, and if you can't stay, this, I, I could talk all day, and I'm going to talk for a couple minutes. Um, 2002, when we started here, we were about two thousand, about a million dollars in debt, and and this church was fairly fresh built, and uh, we owned property next door. There was just so much. We were just living month to month as a church, and we were barely making. And so I, I met with some of the elders of the church. They weren't officially elders, but the people that I saw as elders, and I said, "Why'd you buy this property? Why'd you go into debt? Why'd you do this? What was the vision?" And a friend of mine was here at the church at the time, was an architect, and and I gave him those thoughts and he laid out the property and and it just all of a sudden the vision was renewed for what was going on here and why things were done the way they were we took our time we paid off the debt we were debt free if you didn't know that this church owes nothing we owe no bank no money all right i know that's wrong english but that's okay uh we own nothing nothing we are a debtor to nobody and we've gotten back on track back with the vision the next phase of the vision is to the remodel upstairs and prepare for an auditorium this is a gymnasium. Look at the lines on the floor. We need basketball hoops hanging down. We need these ceiling tiles gone. We need cages over the lights. We need batting cages that roll up into the ceiling. We need soccer goals. We need this room to be used every night of the week. For our community, we've got to stop hoarding our resources. So for that, we'll build an auditorium out on that front lawn. Be less grass to cut, by the way. Uh, but we... <laughs> That was the goal years ago when all this was purchased, when all this was started, was to have that auditorium, a church building, up front. So we've got the money to do the next stage, all cash, not, not a bit of debt to do the next stage. And we've done the homework. Andrew and Mark have really put a lot of time into this. Uh, they've stayed in contact with the different contractors. We've had the bids. This has been a big process, and COVID has made it hard, to say the least. Now we've got a contractor. Now we've got a bid that's in our range that we can pay for. Now we're ready. We just need you all to say yes. Okay, so please, if you're a church member, stick around. That's the big part of the meeting. If you're not, that's where we're going with this, is to have the auditorium up front. That's ultimately the goal, so that this can be a community center. That's what it was built for. All right, that's the, the physical vision of the church. If you want to talk more about it, man, I'll, I'll drink two or three cups of coffees before I end up telling you everything. But it's exciting to see what God is doing here in our church, in his church. And you have been faithful stewards, and that's why we have the finances to do it, okay? So God bless you for what you've already done. Stick around for the meeting, those of you who want to be a part of it. Tony, would you close us in a word of prayer? Let's everybody bow your head. Your gracious Heavenly Father, Lord just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you for your grace and your mercy on us, Lord, allowing us to come here and just be able to worship your name, Lord, and sing praises to you. And, Lord, thank you for our pastors, that they open the Bible, Lord, and they lead God and direct us and correct us, Lord, when we are wrong, Lord, that they teach us what your word says and how to live by it. Lord, be with us as we go out here. Let people see our light in the community. Let them See that we are Christ followers, Lord, in all that we do. Lord, help us submit to those in authority over us, Lord, and let us trust in your sovereignty, Lord, and trust in your justice. Lord, lead God and direct us in all that we do. 
so we name it we pray amen those, yes those of you stay in chapel we're going to the chapel right after this for the meeting <laughs>